Mr. Uh, Board will come forward. And uh, Senator, would you take the roll call rule, please? Governor Kitzhopper? Here. Nancy Gold? Here. Julia Brian Edwards? Here. Yvonne Curtis? Here. Matthew Donegan? Samuel Henry? Here. Nicole Maher? Here. Mark Bogdell? Here. David Reeves? Here. Ron Saxton? Here. Mary Stogie? Here. Kate Turan? Hannah Vandery? Here. Dick with now? Yes. Pretty good. Um, can we start with the approval of the minutes from the last meeting? Is there a motion? So moved. Can we move that we approve the minutes of the last meeting? Second. Is there a discussion? Second. Second. Good. Discussion on the motion? Very good. So um, I thought we'd start, I think the first item is a legislative uh, update. We have uh, a number of bills that uh, I'm going to have Ben give us an update on. Uh, the three bills that deal with the strategic investments, which are House Bills 3232 and 3233, and Senate 222. Uh, a couple of bills that deal with streamlining and, and strengthening uh, our university system, Senate 270 and House Bill 3120. And then, of course, the uh, reform of our early learning system, which is House Bill 2013. Um, I'll give you just a real quick, well, Ben's. Uh, Handing some stuff out here, I'm going to give you um, an update on the budget. As you know, the co-chair's budget um, came out in early March. Uh, it does it, it deviates in a number of ways from uh, my recommended budget. It uh, uh, happily raises the appropriation for the K-12 system uh, to 6.75 billion dollars. Uh, the, the concern is how that's going to be paid for. Uh, they have a, a smaller recommended change in the first system. Uh, there is still an outstanding hole of $125 million in the Department of Human Resources and $40 million in the Department of Corrections and the need for about $275 million in new revenue. Uh, the subcommittees will be reporting back to the co-chairs on April 15th. Uh, we'll find out how much of that DHS and public safety hole can actually be closed and what the remaining uh, gap is. The House is, uh, I think, having hearings today on, on a, a proposed package of, of uh, revenue proposals, which will uh, be certainly controversial. And I view that sort of as the opening uh, conversation. I think this will evolve. But ultimately, I believe uh, any revenue package that the legislature passes will be the result of collaboration between uh, Republican and Democratic members um, of the legislature. So I think the budget picture will become clearer uh, in a few weeks. Uh, with that, ben. Thank you, Governor. Uh, members, for the record, Ben Cannon, Governor's Education Policy Advisor. I've handed out, it should be in front of you, a updated list of bills that uh, we're tracking that relate uh, closely to OEIB and gubernatorial priorities, as well as other bills of interest. Uh, so the list of OEIB priorities is the, identical to the one you received last month, and then we've updated the um, the, the, the second list to add some additional bills that uh, might be of interest to members of the investment board. First thing to note is uh, the deadlines have uh, come uh, and even begun to pass in the legislative session as of yesterday at 5 p.m. bills that were not in one of several policy committees, revenue, ways and means, or rules, or um, scheduled for a work session in another committee um, were uh, are considered dead, so it's the first point in the session where the the bills you know begin to drop off, and you'll see that reflected um, in the final column uh, for some of these bills. Happily, um, all of the bills on the first list of OEIB and governor's priorities have either been signed in the case of the first um, bill, the tuition equity bill that the governor signed last week, or are scheduled for a work session later this week or next. Uh, that includes the bills that the governor referred to um, that would uh, establish policy for the OEIB's proposed strategic investments. They include the bills for um, governance changes related to early learning, youth development, and the post-secondary system. Uh, they include uh, 2013, the uh, kind of uh, delivery system bill for early childhood services. So all of those are um, on track in the sense that they've been scheduled in their relevant um, uh, policy committee for work schedule for work session and we're uh, working closely with the chairs and members of those committees to move them along. In the interest of time, I'll flag just a, a few bills from the second list that 
uh, may be of particular interest. So on, um, uh, I guess it's page three, but House Bill 2192 uh, that would establish um, standards and goals for school policies related to discipline, suspension, or expulsion. This relates um, certainly to work that particularly has been discussed by uh, the Equity and, uh, uh, Partnership Subcommittee of OEIB. I think it's a, a bill that appears generally consistent with the, um, the equity lens and the um, interests of that uh, subcommittee that you'll be discussing uh, later today. So I thought that was worth pointing out, and that is um, on track for a work session actually today, I think, or perhaps tomorrow in House Education. On the next page, um, 2538 and 2640 would alter the composition of the Oregon Education Investment Board by adding uh, members for a uh, particular, uh, uh, particular type. And these bills are still, I would say, very much in flux um, in terms of precisely what amendments might be adopted. And, and um, we are uh, conveying, um, you know, working, with the, working with the chairs and, and, and members uh, on those. Uh, House Bill 2748, uh, you may have seen some attention about, uh, it relates to tuition for out-of-district students and how that might intersect with a, um, with a system that has a, essentially an open enrollment policy now. Um, a lot of amendments have been drafted and discussed, a work session um, scheduled still, but uh, like many of these others, other bills, its form, even in its first chamber, is still very much um, under discussion and it isn't uh, possible, at least for me, to tell yet where that may land um, in that committee or in the House. Uh, skipping ahead a couple of pages, House Bill uh, 3254 had a, a hearing and work session yesterday. This relates to teacher licensing and um, a proposal that the chalkboard project has helped bring forward. Uh, they've worked pretty closely with TSPC. Um, the uh, the, the commission itself is officially sort of neutral on this bill, but it's a proposal to establish a license for um, instructors as well as for teacher leaders in the interest of building stronger career ladders um, for, um, for the profession. Um, House Bill 3401 is the first of several that um, appear to be moving uh, that deal with ESDs and changes to the ESD system. Generally, um, our work on that issue has been guided by the work that Deputy Superintendent Saxton did with a um, small group of ESD leaders and um, school district superintendents um, to propose some kind of continuing reforms um, to our ESD system. That report, if you haven't seen it and you're interested, would be available from his office or mine. And, um, 3401 and then um, Senate Bill 227 on the following page and um, Senate Bill 529 um, are all um, generally in the spirit of that work and, and, and we've been attempting to um, ensure that those hew as closely as possible to the recommendations that Deputy Superintendent Saxton has brought forward related to uh, education service districts. Um, Senate Bill 11 is one that you uh, have likely read about. It's the state treasurer's proposal uh, to establish a student opportunity fund. This bill uh, was moved out of the policy committee um, around the time of our last OEIB, full uh, regular OEIB meeting early March. It is, sits in ways and means like a number of these bills. So it is, uh, remains alive and has not been taken up for discussion by the Ways and Means Committee, which will be getting to it and other budget uh, policy bills with budgetary implications probably uh, later this month or in May. Um, Senate Bill 222 has been subject of a lot of work in the um, Senate Education Committee. This is generally uh, focused on dual credit and expanding dual credit opportunities. Um, we've worked closely with Senator Haas in the interest of um, assuring alignment between your proposed strategic investment and your emphasis on dual credit uh, and his. Uh, we've uh, helped him with uh, an amendment that um, actually pulls some of the policy language that we put related to your strategic investment on uh, creating a culture of um, support for uh, guidance and support for post-secondary aspirations. We've pulled some of that language into an amendment that he is um, interested in adopting. So that is scheduled for work session and we believe that will move um, out of the Senate committee and down to Ways and Means next week. And the um, final, I guess, couple that I'll note, um, 
Senate Bill 297 perhaps should be um, sort of elevated now to the, the first list of priorities. Um, as drafted, this bill did not, uh, went farther than the motion that OEIB adopted relative to including parents on achievement compact advisory committees. Uh, my understanding is the amendments now currently under consideration by the Senate committee um, would uh, align this bill, Senate Bill 297, with the motion that the OEIB adopted in support of including parents on achievement compact advisory committees. You'll recall that there was a statutory barrier to that um, that was, uh, from our point, from our standpoint, inadvertent uh, in the legislation from last year. And so we have expressed, uh, on behalf of the governor, the board, Dr. Crew, um, our support for moving forward with that amended version of Senate Bill 297, and would certainly encourage. Um, um, and welcome uh, members of, of this board to weigh in um, in in that capacity. This is uh, a, a priority for us. The um, final two, uh, just the last two on the on the last page, uh, Senate Bill 702 uh, is an interesting proposal to award at least 50 percent of Oregon Opportunity Grant dollars to uh, STEM majors. Um, I think the Student Access Commission has raised some concerns related to how this would be implemented. Nevertheless, the bill is uh, in ways and means. It did pass out of the policy committee. We'll be continuing to work with legislators to ensure that if this is something they are really serious about uh, adopting, that we um, that it is uh, practicable. And I'm, it's not obvious that that's the case yet in terms of how this bill is currently constructed. But certainly. Um, is in, a, in its spirit, I think, aligned with some of the thinking that this board and, and Dr. Crew have done around creating uh, incentives and supports for students who are pursuing STEM uh, degrees. And then um, finally, Senate Bill 70, 755 um, is, um, it says actually, it says here Senate floor vote pending. I'll need to check on that because I think that may actually be heading down to ways and means, but it, um, does relate to the Minority Teacher Act and the requirement that we produce a report um, uh, biannually related to our progress towards ensuring that our um, workforce, our education workforce, um, better reflects the diversity of Oregon's uh, population, uh, which is something that um, it has failed to do. So we're uh, generally supportive of this effort to update this statute and um, and enhance um, the, the 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 power and importance of this of, of this act. So that's um, kind of quick rundown. There's a lot of information here. Um, things are moving quickly at this point in the session. Fortunately, next time I think the list will be shorter because, as I said, bills are the, it's starting to get winnowed out, and um, we'll get a clearer sense of what the kind of end of session um, will look like by next month's meeting. One question, Dan, and I'll open it up. Uh, you may have covered this, uh, but can you tell me the status of, we had a bill in that was, I think it was a budget item on the teacher effectiveness centers. Uh, what, what, what are, can you just recap where we are on that? Yeah, so. Is it a vehicle or is this just a conversation that, that uh, we're obviously going to bring to it? Yeah, so uh, Governor, members, uh, the Educator Quality Network in House Bill 3233 um, is the uh, how we've um, sort of updated and refined the the work that the board brought forward related to improving the um, supports for uh, the education profession. So the policy for that is contained in 3233. It's in the House Education Committee. Um, our hope is that that committee will vote it down to Ways and Means where there will be continuing conversation with the Ways and Means co-chairs on, on funding for it. Uh, any questions today? Uh, just a question on um, Senate Bill 297, the parent um, piece. Have we as a entity communicated um, our support for it as an entity versus asking individual members to yeah, so Dr. Crew um, sent a letter um, to the Senate 
Education Committee expressing uh, the board's support for the version of this bill that would do what the motion you adopted um, uh, 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 required. So that that has been transmitted, transmitted and continues to be transmitted to to the um, Senate Education Committee. Yes, please. Um, House Bill 2640. Um, just have a question because this was the first time it's on my radar screen. Um, I can't tell. So the other bills of interest, I don't know if we weighed in on this, but I guess one question I would have it appears that this creates a slot for a specific um, organization, and I guess I would be interested in uh, whether we have a point of view just that currently how we're organized, um, no business, no community college, uh, no individual school district has a designated slot, so just the sort of precedent we might be setting in terms of um, designating that a slot be for a specific um, project. Mm -hmm. And just the concern that the flexibility um, and just um, the governor has and sort of appointing OEIB board members of um, sort of a limitation on that and become a more slot oriented board versus a board that's. Yeah, I, I actually share that concern personally and, and I'll, I, I've communicated that to the legislative leadership, not that the representative of the OEIB, but I just, or as a, the chairperson of the OEIB, or even as governor, I just think that once we start slotting a 13 member board, I don't know where to get in. It's important that we have, you know, we have parents have obviously a very important role, but I'm not sure that designating that is uh, any more or less important than designating someone from the U.S. or someone from what we call a classified employees. And so I, I, I'm personally not supportive of that. And if this so in House Bill 2538, it's similar to add a position that is from a particular group, which would be a school board member, so is that... Same, same thing. Yeah, is that your same... Yes. Okay, thank you, Ben. Thanks. Um, the next item has to do with uh, uh, a process, uh, a proposed process to evaluate the performance of our, our chief education uh, officer. Mm -hmm. We've had discussed that, and uh, Nancy uh, has... Uh, uh, develop a proposal which I'd like her to walk through uh, would be uh, our intent to actually adopt this uh, at the next meeting, but I wanted to have her walk through that and make sure that uh, we're comfortable with the approach that she's doing. Yeah, I want to begin by recognizing Kathleen McNeely, who uh, worked with me on this. And just so that you all know, this is a, oh, there you are. So thank you very much. Good luck in your new roles. Um, this is a process that this is we sent the to OEIB members last night. This is a first reading. We want to get input from you today, and then we do want to ask you between in the next two weeks if you have more input to give it to us. We've also been zigzagging back and forth with Rudy to make sure that um, this feels good to him. So. What you'll see in this, in the beginning, you'll just see a timeline of how we would approach this. And it would begin with the um, Rudy in his position doing a reflection by actually filling this out. And if at our, board, at our board retreat we had a scoreboard, which is sort of our measure of how are we doing as a OEIB, and of course Rudy as our leader, is that would reflect on how was he doing? He'd look at section one. You see here's the section one analysis of scorecard. So he would give us input about where we made progress and if there wasn't significant changes, what resources and new strategies are needed to uh, achieve desired results. Then he would fill out um, the rest of this document. So if we just look under it, if you stay on page one, the first section is around leadership, and you'll see a number of indicators that um, as a leader he would do in order that we achieve the 40 40 20. The second area is uh, strategy formulation, and then 
the section under that is strategic execution, and the last one is and then external relationships, human resource management, and what you'll see after, so Rudy will fill this out, and then it will be given to us, so we would have the benefit of his thinking about um, his strengths in these areas, and then the areas he wants to focus on to um, work on, and he would give that to us as we fill out ours, because as OEIB members, um, there are some things we might not know without hearing his reflections about that. So we would fill it out, and what would be really important would be that if you see the section, uh, please provide information that will help us understand your score in this category. Uh, why that is important is we will gather all of these OEIB forms, your performance appraisal, and a subcommittee, which will be made up of members, will then uh, synthesize that data, and then based on that data, we'll just talk about uh, what can we do to uh, support Rudy and any suggestions we have about areas that he needs to focus on as we move together in, into um, the next year. So that's pretty much an overview. Uh, maybe I could open it up to questions and see first if there are any questions, any input. Why don't you take a minute to look at it? Uh, and then, you know, there's a couple of weeks of me. We're going to we'll bring this back in, in May. And I am going to appoint something I know uh, Hannah is interested in serving as anyone else. Just take your moment that's interested. I will seek you out if you want to find out. Except for President Chris over there. Um, yes, please. So, first, thank you for getting this started, Nancy. Uh, so, with this evaluation, Dr. Cruz is going to fill it out, what, and then we will fill it out. How do we get stakeholders who are engaging in the work? I mean, I think as we looked at our evaluation, we'll need to get feedback from stakeholders as well. Are we really engaging in conversations with them with that interaction? I see that the last part of the evaluation is around um, the chief education officers working with staff. Is there going to be staff input that's gathered? Is that process outside of this? I, I guess you understand. So for your first question, uh, if you remember at the retreat, there's a customer satisfaction survey that Ruby has suggested doing. So of course, we're just into the strategic plan. So I think that would be the vehicle in future years that we could look at the results of that that would help us think about that. Because I know Rudy really wants to make sure he sees how we're serving all our stakeholders out there. So we probably won't have that for this year because we're, we're in what I call a ramp up. We're not full system yet. The second one, I mean, I think it would be reasonable for um, the staff to fill this out too. And of course, um, you know, we would collect data by staff data and OEIB member data and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, one thing that might be worthwhile, I'm sorry I missed the earlier conversation on it, um, but to go back to the recruitment process and what we outlined as the job responsibilities and make sure that um, this document reflects that. Um, so what we said the job entailed um, and just to make sure that we're not missing some key components that we had been clear about what we were looking for and wanting the Chief Education Officer to drive um, that's embedded in this ongoing work. Great suggestion. I think we did some of that, but we didn't. We revised this multiple times, so we need to go back and do a crosswalk of that, so we'll do that. Nancy, could you elaborate a little more about the board's um, evaluation? Because, you know, so many times we go through this process and we're talking about Rudy's performance, and also, Implication is the whole overall organization is a team and we can include right. reference as well. So, could you elaborate a little more on that process so I can see how it aligns? Well, um, I think that that's a good point. I think, in addition to Rudy having a performance appraisal, we need to have a performance 
appraisal and uh, really thanks for stepping up first and saying, you know, I need to go first. So maybe what we can do is get through this process, and I think some will be similar, but then we could start putting together. I told the governor I would help um, put these together and be on the committee to help synthesize data. So why don't we get the feedback about this and then we can start into thinking about what would an appraisal look like for us. And I think I'll start that by sending out questions to you, like what do you think should be on that? And then we'll go from there to, um, to coming back with a proposed appraisal. Yeah. I thank you, Nancy, for bringing up our conversation at the retreat. I think we had a really good conversation there about some of the things that we wanted to do. And I think that Dr. Crew outlined a lot of um, steps that we can take that will be uh, beneficial. And it might be good to, to maybe get that down um, prior to the next meeting because I think it is a package deal that we're looking at the entire board and um, our chief education officer and what we do moving forward should be aligned. That will help me and just um, make sure that I give it input. And I think we need kind of a flow chart that brings all of that into it and shows where this is. And then I could also add where we would put our own uh, appraisal. So that's the crosswalk. Incredibly robust process, as well as um, we actually 
invited a whole group of individuals from across the state of Oregon to serve in an advisory capacity to the subcommittee. So we had a lot of dedicated people supporting and helping us. Um, we have a charge as a equity and partnership committee to really have a focus on these particular issues. And in our early meetings, we decided that the most important thing that we could do and our highest priority was to create an equity lens for, for this work. And so um, while we have a larger charge and many more issues to address, this was our most important task. And we felt a sense of urgency around completing this task in a fairly aggressive uh, timeline. Um, we wanted to be very, very clear that as the um, highest educational policy board in this state that we were sending a very, very clear message that we believe that every child can learn and that we have a responsibility to develop and shape a system that responds to the needs of an individual child, children in the communities that they live in. And we wanted to provide a policy that would support uh, both Rob and Rudy to the highest level to make the appropriate changes needed. Uh, with that said, we had quite a big challenge as there are many, many perspectives about how to do this work and the best way to do this work. And uh, we were fairly impressed and overwhelmed and incredibly appreciative of all of the tremendous support that came from every part of the state really clearly articulating how important this work was. And you will see from your handout that we engaged well over 50 groups to receive feedback. Um, you'll see in the audience we have a group of students from Roosevelt who provided direct feedback on the lens. Um, we reached out to the business community and every educational advocacy group that we could come up with. Um, we did this by uh, inviting to meet with folks in person, receiving written comment, as well as having uh, phone conversations. And so we felt like in order for this to be successful, we had to be really intentional. Uh, our process really included several discussions as a subcommittee and as an advisory committee, and then a deep community engagement effort. And what I'm going to do now is actually share specifically around some of the, the challenges that we had and some of the tougher discussions that took place. Um, what we found prior to creating this lens was that there really are some um, trends nationally and on a local level around um, when these types of documents can be really helpful and lead to change. And one of the things that we found was that when you can be more concise and clear about what you're trying to accomplish and what your beliefs and values are, you're much more likely to be successful. Uh, the, the challenges we faced is that, uh, as you can imagine, with that robust of a community engagement process, this document could have literally been 20 pages. Um, and so we had to uh, make some choices about what to include and what not to include. And I'm sure there's some folks that suggested language that wasn't included who are disappointed as a result, so I'll acknowledge that. Uh, additionally, there was real pressure to include every single possible group um, under the sun that has experienced inequality and disparity. And we certainly did not want to be in a position where we were creating a hierarchy of disparity. Uh, at the same time, we found that equity lenses that are the most effective are really clear about their focus, and we uh, chose to do that as a result. There was a constant tension um, where folks repeatedly brought up that they would prefer not to talk about race, but they would prefer to have a conversation about poverty. And the way that we looked at that was really to just look at the data. And what we found is that um, in this state, there are um, achievement differences for white students depending on their income level. But when you look at um, several populations of color, uh, the overall impact on, on performance and outcomes is really about race, not as much poverty. And lots of smart people look at the data all the time, um, and it's a really hard conversation to talk about because people are much more comfortable discussing poverty than they are institutional racism. And as we um, move forward in these conversations, we felt like it was incredibly important to have a, um, and we received a lot of overwhelming feedback um, 
In fact, the feedback from the majority of folks was to be explicit that we need to have a focus on race and ethnicity and that students uh, represented in those populations actually represent the best opportunity for Oregon to improve. And so we grappled with that head on and um, to, chose to move forward in that direction. There certainly were other issues that came up um, where folks really wanted us to focus on um, other populations. And we don't feel like by focusing on race or ethnicity, we're leaving any of those populations out. In fact, students of color are underserved in all of those populations as well. And as you'll notice throughout our belief statement, we actually called out explicitly some really um, high priority areas, um, such as disability uh, and so forth. Uh, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to, to Doris to speak more explicitly to the document. Um, and I think that the most important message that we want to come out of this document is that we believe in every student in Oregon. Um, we believe that students who have previously been labeled as at risk um, are actually our best opportunity. And we believe that it is the responsibility of the adults to renovate our system and move away from a culture of blaming students um, to take an accountability as adults to reform our system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, before you do that, can I just call on Rob Sachs? He gave me an interesting statistic yesterday, if you can recall it, which I think really uh, points to the, the importance of uh, viewing this as a, a poverty and race, not just, uh, uh, not just poverty. The, 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 you know the conversation you had? Uh, it was a statistic about um, outcomes on the ACT and the SAT for students over time um, based on race and or uh, poverty or uh, socioeconomic status, basically. And it was that for our, for our uh, most wealthy African-American students, outcomes on the ACT and the SAT typically year over year are um, superior, or, or, or I'm sorry, are inferior from our least affluent white students. So most affluent African American as compared to least affluent white students on the SAT typically um, our uh, lowest income white students outperform our most affluent African American. And you can do that same statistic on uh, Latino students, you know, see that our most affluent Latino students barely typically outperform um, our least affluent white students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Kitts Harper and um, the OEIB board to Dr. Crew. I am excited to be here this afternoon. Um, the reason for my excitement is around a lot of things. As an OEIB staff member, I get to go out into the community and actually hear from voices. So today, I was thinking about all of the speeches I'm going to deliver this week. And I said, well, I got a different title for this one and that one. What am I going to call today? So I'm calling it the face of policy. Because as I go through the presentation, interspersed will be people who will come up and talk about different parts of the equity lens and help you to put a face with the, po with the policy that we're talking about. So I want to start with the charge to the committee. The Equity and Partnerships Committee is charged specifically to develop strategies for OEIB around out-of-school youth and to overcome the challenges that are associated with race, with ethnicity, with poverty, and with language. And uh, Nicole has already uh, acknowledged the subcommittee, but I just want to do that again because we could not have done this without everyone's input and hard work. So Julia Brim Edwards, Samuel Henry, and then Governor Kitts Harbor, who was able to attend some of our meetings, and we're so grateful. So thank you for that. Nicole has also talked a little bit about the process for reviewing the lens, but I just want to go through a couple of things. We had a, as broad as possible, uh, or as possible we feel, um, discussion with staff to get their feedback. So the, the draft itself has gone through many iterations over the past several months. We have an advisory committee of about 10 people from across Oregon who were pulled together to also give us advice on the equity lens and other work that the Equity and Partnerships Committee is doing. We also had an outreach to our community-based organizations and individuals. A letter was sent in your board package. You have an Excel sheet 
that'll show you all of the people who were uh, contacted either by email or by mail. Uh, in addition to that, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Roosevelt High School to the P uh, PSU inquiry class and actually did an activity, taught the class, so to speak, um, the equity lens and got their feedback. I had a group of students who were the OEIB and a group of students who were the presenters. And they had to come up with questions that they would ask the board. And the board had to come up with questions they would ask the presenters. So it was an engaging activity for these students. And some of the students you'll hear from a bit later. We also met with the community. So I've, got, I've uh, been out uh, to the Multnomah Athletic Club talking to a group of community um, persons as well. And then we had invited public testimony today that I think you will also find very helpful as you consider adopting this lens for OEIB. So the format of the lens itself, you'll see that there's a preamble, there are belief statements, the purpose of the lens, the case for equity itself, and then addendums. And in the addendums are the basic features of the lens as well as definitions. So today we're not going to spend a lot of time on the definitions, but I'll start talking a bit about the preamble itself. So the preamble, if you think about the preamble, it's that introduction to what is this concept of the equity lens is all about. In one of my conversations with a community uh, person, they said, you know, if you think about it, equity is the process to equality. And that kind of resonated with me. Equity is the process to equality. So the preamble itself is that statement, that vision of how we're going to attain educational equity and excellence in our state. The resources, what are the resources that are needed to guarantee student success? So when we talk about the lens itself, we also have to think about, as an investment board, what are we willing to invest in? If we think about education, education is tied to the prosperity of Oregon. So in our preamble, that is stated as well. The opportunity gap is also stated. Achievement gap and the status of our students in Oregon. And I just would like to just take a minute and read a section of the uh, preamble to your hearing. It's in the second paragraph, uh, and you should have the preamble in the notebook. In the second paragraph it says, while students of color make up over 30% of our state and are growing at an inspiriting rate, our achievement gap has continued to persist. Continued to persist. And so we want to uh, have that as uh, how, what we're addressing as part of the Oregon Education Investment Board um, vision, a preamble and staff. And then the implementing the concrete criteria and policy for Oregon's children. And again, uh, in the third paragraph, we believe that one of our most critical responsibilities going forward is to implement a set of concrete criteria and policies in order to reverse this trend and deliver the best educational continuum and educational outcome for Oregon's children. And then our focus, as Nicole has said, because we have such a broad um, array of, of information that can come in an equity lens, we decided that race and ethnicity would be the focus of the lens. Otherwise, we were getting into so much detail, getting so much input, that um, we thought if we focused on race and be clear, a lot of our feedback from the community was be clear of, about what it is you want to focus on, because the original versions, there were too many things we were trying to focus on. So with that, I'd like to actually ask for invited public testimony from Sue Levin, if Sue is here from stand for children. And if uh, Mari Watanabe would also come up from the um, Portland Business Alliance. And they will give you a perspective on the equity lens. Thank you, Doris. Governor Kate Sauber, Dr. Perry, members of the committee, thanks. Nice to be here today. 
I'm actually um, delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about this subject. I think um, the equity lens that the board proposes to use to evaluate the effectiveness of the Oregon education system is, um, as, as the governor said, uh, a, a matter of utmost urgency. I think we all know that Oregon's demographics have changed dramatically in the last 20 years. The percentage of students who are low income, who are Latino and or English learner, language learners has roughly tripled in this period of time. I think that our state um, has not responded perhaps with the consistency or the urgency that we should under the circumstances. And that leads to, uh, I think, the unevenness that you see in outcomes for students in different subgroups across our state. So if you hold demographics constant and you hold funding constant, you can see two communities and sometimes two, two schools where one is making steady progress closing the achievement gap uh, and the other has uh, the situation that unfortunately we see in a larger percentage of our, of our districts, which is that we have pretty significant gaps in uh, achievement rates and graduation rates for low-income students, children, children of color. Um, graduation rates uh, for English language learners are below the 50% mark in Oregon, uh, if you look at the five-year graduation rate. Uh, for Latino students, that's about 60% compared to 70% for white students and 79% for Asian students. Um, I included a quote here from the, the Education Trust, which uh, had a 2010 report that stated that low-income students in Oregon sadly rank among the lowest performing in the country and actually have lost ground since 2003. Meanwhile, the gap separating these students from their higher income peers has grown significantly. Um, as, as difficult, I think, as that is for all of us to hear, it's my hope that the equity lens, the principles contained in the equity lens, represents a turning point uh, toward a time when uh, our, our policies will better reflect our population. Um, and the needs of, of these students, and particularly children of color, will be prioritized. Um, I believe that this morning you guys talked about um, ELL instruction statewide. I, I want to point specifically to, to that area. The need for improving English language uh, instruction for English language learners statewide could not be greater. We have, as I said before, Latino students have a 60% graduation rate. English language la learners, that's below 50 uh, and this fall, one in four of our incoming kindergartners was Latino. Um, we are creating a generation of Oregonians who can neither earn an adequate living nor contribute to the prosperity of our state. Uh, that's an outcome that I know that nobody in this, on this board in this room finds acceptable. Uh, and I appreciate that the equity lens is a tangible commitment towards, towards making a change. Um, I'd just like to share that in the last few years, Stanford Children has intentionally reoriented our efforts and the focus of our members to work where the need is greatest. Uh, our staff and our members did a lot of soul searching. We came to the conclusion that while in the past our mission statement said that all children in Oregon should succeed, we as an organization needed to come up with a better definition of all. Um, we acknowledge that the achievement gap in Oregon has widened in the time that Stanford Children has existed as an organization, and that's not acceptable. Um, if we as an organization believe that all children can succeed, we have to intentionally look at the students who are consistently not making it and ask ourselves not just why, but what we can do about it. This spring, we're working in the legislature with coalition partners on a wide array of equity issues, some of which uh, Ben spoke with you about earlier tuition equity, changing the calculation for the poverty weighting uh, is a bill that's going to be heard this Thursday in the Revenue Committee. We are still using 2,000 census data to make that calculation. That's completely unacceptable. Disparate discipline, adding parents to achievement compacts, these are all issues that we believe are really important if you are looking at education in Oregon through an equity lens. Uh, we're ready to work with with you on the OEIB, with school districts, parents and teachers, and other community groups to help narrow Oregon's achievement gap so that all our children have a chance to graduate from high school prepared for and with access to college. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Governor Kitzhopper and members of the Oregon Education Investment Board. My name is Mari Watanabe. I'm the Leadership Portland Director at the Portland Business Alliance and also serve as Executive Director for Partners in Diversity. I'm here on behalf of Sandra McDonough, who's President and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. She regrets she could not be here to testify in support of this initiative today. We are fortunate to have a governor who believes strongly in education reform. Thank you, Governor, for spearheading the landmark legislation, including the recent passage of the tuition equity bill. And thank you to the board for recognizing the need and importance of an equity lens in our education efforts. The Alliance recognizes that a trained and educated workforce is essential to a growing economy. We believe Oregon must improve the quality and output of its education system if it hopes to develop a long-term solution to the economic crisis facing Oregonians, including stagnant job creation and declining per capita income. <clears throat> the equity lens is a critical tool for the future vitality of our region. Our, as Oregon grows more diverse, it is clear that we cannot achieve our 40-40-20 goals without a focus on underrepresented students and students of color. They comprise a growing segment of our student population and as a result represent, present a significant opportunity in improving overall education outcomes for the state. At Partners in Diversity and at the Portland Business Alliance, we know that more and more companies need to attract and retain professionals of color in order to have a competitive advantage and stay relevant in the global marketplace. We have a moral responsibility to make upstream investments in education like the equity lens that seeks to end disparities and gaps of achievement, thereby cultivating a diverse talent pool and workforce for employers to hire from. The workplace reality is such that if we don't address this issue, there won't be an adequate workforce to do the jobs we have in this region. The Value of Jobs Coalition recently released a groundbreaking study examining the Portland Metro's advanced manufacturing sector. The study found that Portland Metro non-white workers and workers who do not speak English at home earn nearly 50% more in manufacturing careers than in non-manufacturing jobs. Post-secondary education, including workforce training and career pathways, are essential in engaging a diverse workforce and contributing to a strong economy. Initiatives like the Equity Lens is vital in diversifying and strengthening our future workforce. We would also like to add that along with race and ethnicity, a focus on special learners should be addressed as all individuals deserve equal opportunity to be a productive member of our regional economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, and thank you to Sue and Mari for their testimony. So the next section of the equity lens itself is about the belief statement. So what is it that you believe? If we have a tangible document, what is it about the beliefs? So I'm, I'm just going to go through briefly a couple of sentences that you'll find captured as part of those beliefs that are listed. So there's a moral imperative to provide an optimal learning environment so that every child, every single child, can be successful in Oregon, will be successful in Oregon. I always say, I just have to stop here, and I won't do a lot of edits, otherwise we won't get through. But I used to say to my district when I was superintendent, it's not about all children, because all children, if I turn around and I look and I say all they're blurred faces. It's about each child. So when I can mentally and when I can physically see each child, it makes a difference in how we respond. So it's a moral imperative for us. Speaking a language other than English is an asset. Our students come to us with many assets. And we, look, we need to look through the lens of assets, not deficits. We believe that um, it's important to have inclusivity. So special education, diverse learners, that's all a part of what we believe in. And I think that Mari said it well. It has to be up front and out there for us. We also received a lot of feedback 
that um, special education not only be included, it was toward the end of the beliefs, but move it up front. So we did that. We must meet the need of a diverse population, and you've already heard about the statistics and you know them. Intentional and proven practices to return our out of youth students to school. And you're going to hear from a young lady that will tell you more about her story. A quality early learner program in disparities and gaps. And we know that, Governor, you have put um, a lot of commitment into early learner programs. Resource allocation demonstrates priorities, so if we're really about equity, where are we putting our resources? Partnerships are key to improving outcomes. This is not something the board can do alone. It's not something that OEIB staff can do alone. It's about partnerships. So you see the room filled with partners today because we can't do this work alone. That's where the face of policy comes in. A broad array of career and job opportunities. We believe that that needs to be provided for our students. We believe that the universities and our colleges and our community colleges all play a critical role. We believe that we need to continue to diversify our teacher workforce, our educator workforce. We believe in a rich history and the culture of learners, and we believe that's a source of pride. And we believe that the single most important piece that turns around student achievement is a great teacher in the classroom, so supporting great teachers. So with that, I'd like to ask our students to come forward, and we have five students, four of them from Roosevelt and one um, student from Salem-Kaiser. So at this time, would Vanessa Barajas, come forward, Shoni, David, Jasmine, and Warren. And they're not speaking in that order. I've kind of messed it up. They'll straighten me out. Oh, Kids okay. are good at that. So we're going to start with Vanessa Barajas. And um, Vanessa is a student who has been recognized by the Boys and Girls Club as Youth of the Year at third time. Uh, second time. Well, next year it'll be third time. So <laughs> I'd like to have you hear Vanessa's story. It's a very compelling one, and I'm sure it'll resonate with many of you. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to share my story with you. The Boys and Girls Club is an organization that changed my life, maybe even saved it. Just four years ago, I was jumped into a gang. I became heavily involved with a culture that would only lead to doors with dead ends. School was not a priority for me. I pretty much hated school, and I thought it was a complete waste of my time. I wouldn't do anything but get into trouble. I went to juvenile detention for the first time when I was 14, and I quickly realized I wasn't going anywhere positive. When I came to the club, my life changed a lot. I got involved in a program called T3, Training Teens for Tomorrow. This program prov provided me with the necessary skills of getting my first job and helped me lay a path for a more positive future. The staff encouraged me to do better in school, so I started changing my habits. In one semester, my GPA went from straight Fs and 1D to all As and 1B. I started to see what hard work and what focusing on the positive could help me accomplish. Then last summer, I was selected as a staff leader for a program called Care Corps. I got to lead, I got to lead in, incoming freshmen through a service project that would impact our community in a positive way. My group chose to create a ceramics room for the local nonprofit Isaac's Room. I was in charge of making sure each person on the team had a role and then supported, support them as they carried out their individual responsibilities. This was a very fulfilling experience and it allowed me to use my leadership skills and strengths in a way I never had before. Just when everything seemed to be going perfect, my past came back to haunt me. My family was victims of a drive-by shooting. We were all lying on the floor trying to stay safe as more than 15 bullets came through our house. Thank God nobody was hurt. 
I was really angry about this and I felt like I wanted to retaliate. Luckily, before I did anything I would regret, I spoke to the staff at the Boys and Girls Club. And like always, they reminded me that one little thing could cost me everything that I worked so hard for. Anytime I have come across a challenge or a barrier, the club is there to help me find a way and keep me on a successful path. One of these paths led me to experience my first plane ride to a leadership summit in Colorado. In Colorado, I got to meet many inspirational Olympic athletes. This experience taught me to never give up on something you want, no matter what situation you are in. Even if you had no, nobody giving you the motivation to keep going, because in life, people aren't always going to be there to tell you what to do and what not to do. Four years ago, I would have never dreamed of graduating high school and going to college. But with the help and encouragement of the club, I have already received three acceptance letters. Now I get to choose my future and prove that anyone can be successful regardless of their circumstances. I want to thank you all for attending this event today and for your support of my future and the futures of all the other youth that are impacted daily by after school and educational school programs. Without the support of individuals like you, the Boys and Girls Club will not be able to provide doors of opportunity for youth like me. Thank you all very much. I'd like to thank Vanessa, and Vanessa is um, the face of we believe in our out-of-school youth. We believe that we can put programs together that can turn students around. That's our belief system in OEIB. I'd also like to introduce Caitlin. Caitlin is the case manager for the T3 program, the Teens for Tomorrow. So Caitlin, thank you for bringing Vanessa. We appreciate it so much. And now I'd like to ask Dr. Lupo. Lou Pro, if he would come forward, yeah, okay. you're welcome to go. I okay. need a hug for Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Dr. Lou Pro is one of the uh, professors that works with the PSU Inquiry Program. He will briefly introduce the program, and then we have four students who will also share a bit with you. So, Dr. Lou Pro. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the board and uh, the governor for having this process for, I'd like to thank Dr. McEwen for facilitating our participation here today. Um, I'd also like to thank the Vanessa Crock and Matt Boyer, my teaching partners at Roosevelt. It's a team taught course. Um, and I especially want to thank the talented students you see here and over here that I have the pleasure of working with every day. Uh, my name is Michael Lupra. I'm an assistant professor at Portland State uh, University. Uh, I coordinate the Senior Inquiry Program, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the program first. Senior Inquiry is a dual credit year-long program offered in partnerships between Portland State University and selected area high schools. Its purpose is to deliver interdisciplinary college-level courses on-site at the high school, preparing students for the unique demands and rewards of college coursework. Senior Inquiry is team taught by high school and university faculty. Our courses are collaboratively developed under the same general education guidelines as PSU's award-winning university studies program uh, and our, our department and our freshman inquiry program, uh, particularly around our four goals of uh, critical thinking, communication, ethics and social responsibility, and diversity of the human experience. Um, our program is currently in four high schools, uh, Westview and Beaverton, Liberty and Hillsboro, and Jefferson and Roosevelt in Portland. And I have the fortune, good fortune to teach at the latter two. Um, in addition to our advocacy of the equity lens here today, um, I'd like to point out briefly that Senior Inquiry is also successfully doing the work of bridging K-12 and higher ed. Um, in providing equitable opportunities for underrepresented groups and building a bridge between our high schools and our universities, Senior Inquiry is a wheel that is already spinning well, a wheel not needing invention. Um, our tires, however, are in desperate need of a sustainable source of air. And to be clear, by air, I, I mean funding. Um, without increased funding, we will soon only be able to to be in the schools where families can afford to pay for the credit, which would effectively eliminate our ability to meet our equity goals. 
Um, based on my experiences teaching at Jefferson and Roosevelt, I wholeheartedly endorse the notion expressed in the equity lens that generating equitable uh, opportunity for underserved Oregonians will pay the most dividends towards the state's 40-40-20 educational achievement goals. The theme for our course this year is race and social justice. So we've been engaging equity issues critically all year. Um, as you're about to see, I have the pleasure of working with some exceptionally talented young people. Um, so I'd like to conclude my remarks um, by outlining the process by which our testimony here today was derived. Uh, as Dr. McEwen mentioned, she um, came before spring break and introduced a draft of the equity lens to the class. Um, after our session with Dr. McEwen, students further interrogated uh, the draft equity lens, writing about and discussing um, the merits and of, uh, of the lens and producing a list of priorities. Um, upon learning of the opportunity to speak here today, we collaboratively developed a set of criteria for selecting our speakers. I would, as I said to the class, I'd be happy to have any one of them representing us today. These are the four that were selected by the, by the class based on that criteria that was collectively developed. Um, and in a testament to the kind of learning community we have uh, at Roosevelt, uh, the, te the testimony you're about to hear was produced with the participation of the whole class, even exchanging notes and, and going over drafts together is, um, the, as, as late as this morning. So I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to the students at this point. We're going to start um, this afternoon with Jasmine Allen. And Jas Jasmine um, has attended both Roosevelt High School and the Metropolitan Learning Center. Um, she's seen, seen questions of diversity play out in different contexts. She's involved in the theater program and was recently selected as valedictorian. Next year, she will be a sustainability scholar in the Honors College at Portland State University. Jasmine. Throughout my educational journey, I have experienced the range of opportunities available to high achieving students in the Portland Public School District. Too often, students that exceed are given no additional opportunities and thus lose patience with a slow-paced curriculum. In my experiences, as I grew older, I saw the extent of classes and activities available shrink. I feel fortunate that I was able to take part in talented and gifted or tag classes before they vanished. I was identified as a tag student in kindergarten and spent the next three years solving forensic cases logic puzzles, and taking part in chemistry experiments with the other TAG students. Because of TAG, I have known since first grade that I want to be a scientist. Also due in part to TAG, I was able to skip third grade. I honestly cannot say if I would still be a high achieving student if I had not had early exposure to the higher level thinking required in TAG classes. I craved the challenges that these classes provided me with. Tragically, these classes were cut after my fourth grade year. I had to resign myself to the slow pace of normal classes. I soon fell from exceeding to meeting math standards due to disinterest. High achieving students need incentives to continue to exceed, be they tag classes, dual credit classes in middle and high school, or even at door school. Dual credit classes like senior inquiry have kept me invested in my education when I otherwise might have given up due to insufficiently rigorous coursework. Another experience that helps high achieving and or unique students is outdoor school. Outdoor school provides sixth grade students with a kinesthetic learning experience. Many students need, but do not often receive, hands-on learning. Most students can only learn so much about ecosystems from a textbook. They need to see the interactions firsthand, and outdoor school is the perfect place to do that. High school students get just as much out of the experience as the sixth graders. I passed the AP or Advanced Placement Environmental Science exam with a score of well qualified, meaning I will receive college credit, due in no small part to the knowledge I obtained at outdoor school while teaching sixth graders about the environment. In my opinion, there's no better way to learn than to teach. I know many bright students who exceed on all tests yet cannot bring themselves to complete inane homework. 
Funding needs to be allocated to this area before more high achievers succumb to mediocrity. Many dropouts are extremely intelligent but find school boring because it is too easy. They need thought-provoking activities to stay in school. In addition, classes for high achievers must be equally dispersed at all schools. It is not fair that my neighborhood has a handful of AP classes, while students at other Portland schools have a full range of AB and IB, AP and IB, or International Baccalaureate coursework. I stand for all high-achieving Roosevelt students when I say that we want the same opportunities to succeed as students in more affluent neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shoni Plunkett is next. Um, if you would introduce yourself, then you don't have to pass the mic all the way back. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Shawnee Punk de la Cruz. I am this year's Roosevelt's Rose Princess. I've also been involved on the Multnomah Youth Commission for two years. Um, I've been involved in theater, sports, music, and student <coughs> government this year. So I fully am involved in my school and my community. I'd like to say thank you for having us here. and. One of our major concerns is the instability of after-school programs in schools. We are constantly having some of our best programs being taken away, yet the need for after-school activities is, is great. There are many students who don't have a sustainable learning environment at home, whether it be from parents having to work multiple jobs or just not having the necessary resources to complete schoolwork. However, programs such as SUN, which stands for Schools United Neighborhoods, it gives students the opportunity for tutoring sessions as well as dinner, which is also very important for students with low-income families. Picture the students who have to move for the third time in four months, the students with no heat, internet, and electricity, the students with nothing in the fridge and nothing in their stomachs, the students that don't have a place to live. For those students, having school libraries open and after-school programs, it's the only way they can get help with their education after the school day is over. We believe that funding and other resources should be allocated to after-school programs because many educational disparities come from outside of school. Mentors from these programs can become role models for students with parents that, are, that aren't always at home or don't have a higher education and can't help their children with their education. We also need to push our children to be able to read before kindergarten. If they can start school with that skill already achieved, then they will be more likely to excel academically. All the speakers here today, half of us being valedictorians, know how to, knew how to read before starting kindergarten and has helped shape our education. Thank you. Thank you, Shoni. And next we'll have Warren. Hello, my name is Warren Bay, and I'm a senior at Rosewood High School, and I'm involved, I'm also a candidate for a valedictorian, and I am involved with our writing center that just recently got established and I'm a writing consultant, so I help students um, with their scholarship essays and their class essays, and just if they need some help with um, writing. And I'm going to talk mainly about the programs that students need. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Um, in middle school, I always found myself reflexively lingering to the library at lunch to converse with my friends. I was never a social person, and at times that negatively affected the experience of my pre-secondary education. But as the redundant school days came to an end, I found myself anticipating the after-school programs offered at my middle school. At these programs, I learned to break out of my shell. Through participating in dance classes, art classes, and a film studies oriented program, I learned skills that opened my mind to the learners of the world. In high school, I only continued to grow. As a high school student, I found myself floating over to the school library as well. Only this time, it was to spend hours with schoolwork. I involved myself with after-school programs such as Step Up, which is an after-school tutoring and mentorship program that changed my life. Meeting the advocates that I always expected the best out of me turned me into the student I am today, determined and motivated. Students need after-school programs with caring adults as well as an open library because these are the places where students like myself take shelter and grow into the students that thrive in today's society. In order for the 4020 to be truly effective, it has to be imp implemented during the pre-secondary stages of education. Then, during these educational stages, students are beginning to find their own identities and their own passions in life. By applying the 4020 to elementary and middle, school, middle schools, 
It will create a base basis that can be built upon as the years go by. Preparing students for the challenges of secondary education has to, has to begin at the levels of uncertainty, where a student discovers the world of education and its vast uniqueness. The only inhibitor of success, then, is the lack of available resources. As seniors in high school, we know all too well that disparities are lie between minority groups and more affluent white students. We believe that students do have the ability to learn and it is our responsibility to help prepare for their own futures. That's why we believe strongly that 4040 must come to incorporate both elementary and middle school institutions because this is the time period most heavily affected by resource allocation. If we are to create a system that benefits all Oregon students, we must implement from the ground up. We're first building our foundation, then expanding from there. This will effectively eliminate social promotions because each and every student will be prepared for their next year of education and wherever life takes them. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. And last but not least, we have um, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> my name is David Lewis. I am currently involved with my <coughs> school's music program. I'm also a student who is heavily involved in SELF as well as other after school programs. And I also am involved with my school's Western Union, who helps organize fundraisers for the school in order to keep our um, basketball, well, multiple teams. Uh, flow and get the new uniforms and whatnot. And I want to thank everyone here for being here and allowing us to speak. Um, one of the most absolutely important things for uh, America is new people coming in from different countries and students uh, who must learn the English language is very important for them to be able to keep up with the students who are American born, but a lot of the time there is a major culture shock. And the culture shock being they don't know what's going on, their customs are completely different, and thusly they don't know what to expect. Uh, many teachers and staff alike assume that the student can assimilate without any problem whatsoever, but that's completely untrue. Um, and the entire program itself is uh, often secondary to what's going on at home with the whole movie and the assimilation of their family as well as themselves. Teachers often um, come in without a, without a deep understanding of the language that their, all their students speak. However, they know that they must learn to speak English and they focus on that, but it is really important for the teachers to have a deep understanding and a deep connection with their students from all walks of life, and uh, I think that it's really important for the students to have a very strong connection so that's much easier for them to learn and they don't have any reservations about speaking out in class so they get the actual learning and the extra uh, hands-on activity that most students crave and need in order to not only succeed but excel in um, modern classrooms. Um, many students, including myself, uh, need supplemental assistance with work, and English is no different than that. It's very much it's very much uh, difficult for students to be in a classroom and not have as much time as others who speak the language before them or have background information as, a, as English speaking people before they come to the country or they were taught it in their other school and many students don't uh, speak, speak English before they come to the school or the country even. Um, some people understand and speak English uh, right off that and because of that it's much easier for them to uh, work in the classroom with their teacher as well as their uh, fellow students but many many people coming in during the middle of the school year moving from different countries uh, they need they don't they may not understand understand the uh, the dialect or anything like that and so I believe that le different level classes are necessary in order to um, supplement the skills that they have uh, and 4420 
wouldn't really be very uh, effective if a student who just recently joined um, a, an American high school in their junior year and plans on graduating is unable to speak even in the basic, uh, using basic principles and dialects and words that most of us use on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the students from Roosevelt. Uh, our students over here as well, would you stand from Roosevelt? Excellent. Excellent. Again, the face of policy. So as we continue our presentation, I'm going to skip the purpose piece because we know the purpose. The purpose is equity, and we need to have a lens with which all of our RFPs, all of our policies, all of our conversations are viewed. So I'm going to skip past that because for me, it's more important that you hear the faces, see the faces, and hear the voices. So as we talk about a case for equity, I'd like to ask uh, if Carmen Rubio and Paula Hernandez would come forward. And I would just like to point out with Paula and with Carmen, especially with, with Paula, and we have um, actually birth to 20. So we have a little one here, too. She, she won't speak for herself, but um, it'll speak for her. So when we talk about equity itself, we're talking about Oregonians having this shared identity, and that in order for Oregon to be successful, we have to have a successful education system. It's vital. Um, and that equity itself means educational success for everyone. So I'm going to ask Carmen if she would talk in general about equity, the case for equity. She is executive director at Latino Network. And then Paula Hernandez will talk from um, the parent perspective. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Governor and members of the board. My name is Carmen Rubio, and I'm the Executive Director of Latino Network, a nonprofit that provides programs in education, <coughs> leadership, and civic engagement for Latino youth and families in Multnomah County. At Latino Network, we provide a culturally specific continuum of programs and services aimed at promoting kindergarten readiness, parent engagement, and leadership and closing the achievement gap among Latino students through middle and high school, extended learning programs, summer school, and after school programs, as well as youth violence prevention. I also serve as the co-chair for the Coalition of Communities of Color, which is an alliance of culturally specific community-based organizations with representation from six communities of color in Multnomah County. Our charge is to advance racial equity through policy, advocacy, research, and coalition building. <coughs> So first, we want to thank you for inviting us to be here today and for having this very important discussion. Our parents and staff at Latino Network are very energized about the equity focus that is central to the work of the OEIB and that you're deliberating the important and critical step of developing an equity lens. The lens enables you to drastically refocus policy attention to where it needs to be on closing the gaps. I'd like to share an example of one such tool that was in part the results of multiple years of advocacy and partnership uh, by the Coalition of Communities of Color and together with Portland Public Schools. While, while it's still a work in progress and we're still working um, on implementation, the racial equity policy was adopted by the Portland Public Schools Board's, Board of Directors and is an example of where a policy that is in place has truly moved equity discussions that at one time were marginalized into front and center and together with CBOs and the, with the community. Since the adoption of the policy it, um, a couple years ago, the district has engaged in more substantial equity discussions with communities of, um, community partners around data, uh, specifically examining disaggregated data in order to focus on the greatest disparities, institutionalizing meaningful parent involvement, um, creating culturally and linguistically welcoming and safe school environments for all children and parents, dual language immersion programs, and ELL student achievement, and then the hiring of bilingual, bicultural teachers and administrators of color. And, and then finally, also prioritizing culturally specific education strategies and partnerships to close the achievement gap. 
So clearly this is only one uh, step in, among multiple that need to happen in order to um, close the gaps that exist. And I don't want to downplay the, the ongoing work that our partners um, and our community advocates play um, in making sure that our resources are aligned to meet these stated policy goals. Um, but I think it also marks the commitment of a new way of working together with the community. Um, and even in our most challenging moments, uh, the policy or the lens helps us to refocus on what matters most in those moments, which is the quality education for all students. So um, utilizing important tools like these will close the chapter where equity discussions and equity issues are viewed as an addendum to a separate education ag agenda, but rather it becomes the education agenda because um, to, to take a quote right out of the draft policy, as Oregonians, we all have a shared destiny. So we really look forward to continuing uh, to see the progress of the work of your board um, and just want you to know that our community really cares and we're eager to be engaged with you in this important work. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce Paula Hernandez. And Paola, Paola is one of our active parents, um, parent leaders, and a participant in our Colegio de Padres program at Lent K-7 through School. So she's going to share her thoughts about equity and why it's important to her family. Muy buenas tardes al gobernador Kitsabe y a todos los representantes de la mesa directiva de inversión en la educación en Oregon. Good afternoon, Governor Kitzhaber, and all the representatives of the OEIB board. Me llamo Paula Hernández. Estoy aquí representando a todos los padres latinos de las escuelas públicas de Puerto. My name is Paula Hernández, and I'm here representing all the parents, uh, Latino parents from Portland Public Schools. Soy miembro del grupo Colegio de Padres de Latino Network. I am a member of Colegio de Padres uh, from Latino Network. A padres a navegador en el sistema educativo. Which helps parents navigate the educational system. Estoy aquí para abogar para que adopten una, un lente equitativo. I'm here to advocate that you adopt an equity lens. Para las demás familias, para que las demás familias no pasen lo que nuestras familias pasan. So that other families don't go through what my family went through. Yo viví una experiencia muy desagradable. I lived a very uh, displeasant experience. Una de mis hijas fue víctima de abuso físico. One of my daughters was a victim of physical abuse. Un día mi niña regresó de la escuela y estaba llorando. One day my daughter came from, us, from school and was crying. Y no quería que ni la abrazara ni hablar conmigo. She didn't even want me to hug her and she didn't want to speak with me. Le di un momento para darme confianza. I gave her some time so that she could see the, uh, build the trust. Ella me contó lo que le pasaba. She told me what happened. Entendí rápidamente qué es lo que sucedía. I quickly understood what, what had happened. Y para eso tuve que ir al doctor de emergencias. And for that I had to go into the emer uh, doctor and emergency. Ellos comprobaron que sí había abuso físico. They uh, were able to tell that there was physical abuse. Entonces acudí a llamar a la escuela de mi niña. So I went to call my daughter's school. Para hablar con la directora, ella hizo una cita para mí. To speak with the principal, she made an appointment for me. Y traté de buscar asesoría, pero nadie me pudo ayudar. I tried to find help, but nobody was able to help me. La organización Portland, Public, uh, Portland Impact fue la que me ayudó. Portland, the organization Portland Impact was able to help me. Pero solo con ir a traducirme en mi idioma. But only to go and interpret for me in my language. Cuando la escuela vio que yo llevaba a una trabajadora de Portland Impact. When the school saw that I had taken an employee from Portland Impact. Dijeron que no podían aceptar. They said they couldn't accept that. Que solo que ellos iban a proveer un traductor. They said that they would provide an interpreter. Les dije que estaba bien. I said that was okay. Estuvimos en la mesa, la directora. We were at the table, the principal. 
y la maestra sustituta de ese día. And the substitute teacher for that day. Le conté y le pregunté que qué había pasado ese día. I explained and then I asked her what had happened that day. Que no sabían nada. That they said they didn't know anything. Entonces les conté lo que me había dicho la niña y lo que me dijo el doctor. So then I told him what the girl had told my, the girl la niña, so sí. what my daughter had told me and what the doctor had said. Ellos me dijeron que no sabían nada y que mi niña estaba confundida. They said they knew nothing and that my daughter was confused. Entonces, y les dije que es, um, que ellos solo habían hablado de los cuerpos de niña y niño. ¿Cuál era la diferencia? They said that they had just talked about boys and girls' bodies uh, and what the differences are. En la manera que me lo dijeron, trataron de mentirosa a mi niña. And the way that they explained to me, they judged my daughter as being a liar. Pero yo le creo más a mi niña que a otra persona que no es de mi familia. But I believe my daughter more than another person who's not a member of my family. Me pusieron barreras al no dar seguimiento requerido. They put barriers up by not following, giving it the, follow, the proper follow-up. Por no poderme dar un <coughs> intérprete independiente. By not providing an independent interpreter. Y darme una versión diferente. And giving me a different version. No me sentí satisfecha I con was, los resultados. I didn't feel satisfied with the results. Ni el manejo de la situación. Nor the way they handled the situation. Sin embargo, however, encontré fuerzas de la situación. I found strength in the situation. Eso hizo hacerme más fuerte. That made me become stronger. Para involucrarme más en la educación de mis hijos to be more involved in my children's education. Entonces, busqué justicia en la comunidad y no la encontraba. So I was looking for justice in the community and not being able to find it. Eso hizo que me involucrara más en la comunidad para buscar um, el colegio de padres. That made me get involved more with the community and was able to find colegio de padres. De Latino Network. From Latino Network que me ha brindado el apoyo para conocer mis derechos. Who has provided the support to understand my rights. Si hubiera una política de equidad en la, en la escuela, hubiera reconocido su falta y da el seguimiento adecuado a la situación. If there were an equity policy in place at the school, they would have uh, recognized uh, their, their mishap and would, I, would have been able to give the proper follow-up to the situation. Me gustaría abogar que adopten una política para usar un lente equitativo. I would like to advocate that you enact a policy to use an equity lens. Para informar al sistema educativo que haya y que traiga equidad y calidad de educación. So that the, the, that it can advise the educational system and bring equity and quality education para nuestros hijos y nuestro futuro. for our children and for our future. Principalmente estoy pidiendo equidad I am uh, primarily asking for equity para todas las familias sin importar el nivel económico. For all families uh, not with, without regard to economic levels or economic income sin importar el color de piel. Without, take, without taking, or, I'm sorry, without taking into consideration the person's color of skin. Que todos los niños sean iguales. That are all children be equal. Y el mismo trato. And the same treatment. Y el nivel educativo. And for the level of education. Por ejemplo. For example. Nuestros niños no tienen cómo desarrollar su talento. Our kids don't have a way of developing their talent. Y no tenemos las herramientas necesarias. And we don't have the necessary tools. También necesitamos que los maestros del programa inmersión We also need that teachers in immersion programs tengan la suficiente preparación para el desempeño educativo. Have the sufficient or proper training to develop their educational program. 
y la, y la capacidad de enseñar y no confundir. And the ability to inform and not confuse. También la preparación y del personal y competencia cultural. And also have improved uh, competency of the personnel as well as cultural competency. Yo quiero dar las gracias a la mesa directiva I want to thank the board de la inversión de Oregon for the uh, investment in education of Oregon por darme la oportunidad for giving me the opportunity de alzar mi voz to raise my voice las necesidades y preocupaciones my uh, problems and needs de las familias y la comunidad of families and the community y proveer fondos and to, by, for providing funds al programa Latino Network de Padres y Familias to the pro, uh, Latino Network's uh, Youth and Family Program. Muchísimas gracias y que tengan buenas tardes. Thank you very much and may you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like... Can you pass me the mic? I'd like to thank uh, Carmen Rubio uh, Bala Hernandez and Victor for their testimony. Um, appreciate their thoughtfulness. As we think about the lens itself, uh, there are uh, basic features I call the how. That moves us into looking at how is that implemented. Taking a look at questions that, that help districts and help communities reflect on whether or not the equity uh, lens is being used in an appropriate way. So we, we're going to wrap up with um, the advocacy commissions and then Rob Saxton will close us out in the public testimony. So if the advocacy commissioners would come forward and they all know they're going to keep this very brief because we're ready to wrap this up. Um, but I do not want to lose their voice in this conversation. So we're going to start with Carlo Perez. Carlos, you would introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, uh, Governor Kitzhaber and Board, for inviting us to share our comments today. I'm Carlos Perez, representing the Oregon Commission on Hispanic Affairs. I'm here today with my colleagues in support of the Equity Lens. With me today are James Manning with the Oregon Commission on Black Affairs and Michelle Vashling with the Oregon Commission of Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. We come today representing the advocacy commissions. You have written testimony uh, that we had previously provided, but we will now take a few moments to share why the equity lens is important to us. As an advocate for the Latino community, the reasons for adopting the equity lens are clear. The achievement gap that exists between Latino students and their white counterparts, the high dropout rate and low graduation rate of Latinos, the absence of Latinos and advanced placement opportunities, disproportionate discipline administered to our youth, disproportionate numbers of Latino students identified as SPED but underrepresented in TAG, the systematic exclusion of Latino parents from their student school and school governance, ELL students languishing in English as a second language courses without opportunity to exit fluent in English, the lack of role models, Latino teachers and administrators to inspire students to strive for post-secondary education. Many of today's educators are unprepared and ill-equipped to serve Latino students or students of color. And oftentimes, Latino students, regardless of their legal status, are viewed as undocumented persons and undeserving of an education. It is time to level the playing field and provide the opportunity for each student to be successful. The equity lens providing that it is used with consistency and fidelity is the framework to drive the work. As an educational system, we need to be intentional and purposeful in the decisions we make in programs, practices, and financial investments to ensure that the issues of race and ethnicity do not impede anyone's education. In 1969, a Chicano poet, Abelardo Delgado, wrote about a Chicano student who could not read or write dying with a thousand masterpieces hanging only from his mind. The condition that led to the writing of this poem 40 plus years ago still exists today. I respectfully request you adopt the equity lens 
as presented by the Equity and Partnership Subcommittee to drive the work so important to the educational success of the state's Latino students and each child in general. Thank you. James? Thank you, Carla. I tried to go as fast as I could. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Boy, it's very nice to be here, and it is, in fact, an honor. My name is James Manning, and I'm here representing the Oregon Commission on Black Affairs. Uh, we sincerely support the Equity Lens program. We think it's vital to the educational process of all the children here in the state of Oregon. I did have a very lengthy uh, speech that I was going to bring, but then I found out that we were condensed to five minutes that we need to split amongst ourselves. So I'll just share one personal story with you. Uh, this story reflects uh, my relationship with a young man in the uh, Eugene Springfield area. Uh, I've also been committed to uh, gang prevention and awareness in the Eugene area as well. Well, this young man was going to school one day and he was approached by a gang and they told him that if he didn't join the gang, uh, that they would beat him up every day that he went to school. Uh, so. As a backup, the young man did what he thought was the proper thing to do, and that was to protect himself or try to protect himself. Inadvertently or directly, he decided to take a weapon, a knife, to school. It was discovered that he had a knife, and he was expelled from school. The young man wanted to continue his education process, so he enrolled himself in the Oregon Youth Challenge Camp, if you're familiar with that, and he successfully completed that. Once he completed the course, uh, his desires was to go back to uh, regular high school, but he found out that uh, he was not able to. Here is the situation. We have a young man that's now attending an alternative high school with a desire to go back and attend regular school, and he made one mistake. From my work and my experience in life, if you never have to have a second chance, then you're very privileged. If you've had one, two, three, or four second chances, then you're very fortunate. But if you never have the opportunity to have a chance, then it's a shame on us. It's a shame on our education system, uh, how we segregate people and treat them differently for one minor mistake. This young man is very timid, uh, but he did the best thing he's doing, new to the area. I ask your support, uh, as we support, or with support of the, uh, uh, the lens, and that you look at our education program in a different light. In my tenure in the military, I was asked, how do you measure success? And my response would be, my success is measured on the success of others. If we look back in Oregon years from now and say, how do we measure our education success? Then we have to say it was a success of us and how we put this thing together in support of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Michelle. Good afternoon, Governor and Board. My name is Michelle Blatch, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Commission, Oregon Commission for Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. And I also will keep this very brief. Um, I'm more of a number cruncher, and um, back in my office, I took a look at some of the numbers of the of students that were being disciplined and the issue of disproportionate disproportionate discipline of minority students. And one of the things that struck me in and also in my representation of the Asians and Pacific Islanders, is that there are 0.3% of our Oregon population, I think in the 2010 Census Bureau, is of Native American or Pacific Island affair, uh, Pacific Islanders, but 90% of them are involved in discipline in our schools. And so what I, you know, I, as a member of the commission, um, we support the equity lens, and I would like to see more focus put on opportunities for our students rather than discipline. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity, opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the commission. I'd like to ask Rob Saxton if he would give some um, testimony to kind of bring all of this together, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole for any other comments. Thank you, Doris. Appreciate it. Uh, Governor Kitzhaber, Mr. Boy, I'd be for the record, Rob Saxton, to kind of tell the discussion. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute uh, to uh, commend the committee that did the work on putting this document together. It's really a, a very rich document. I, I have read it, read through it any number of times, and I also want to tell you I appreciate the opportunity to give you some input and feedback and to recognize the level of input and feedback that you took in putting this document together. I saw its original. Um, I saw a lot of the input that people gave to you over the course of time, and I see their words contained uh, within the document. Your ability to really focus on equity, 
uh, especially uh, looking at trying to close the achievement gap and uh, around for our students of color is really strong and right on point and uh, could not be better. It's very difficult to write a document like this. I've attempted to write uh, a number of these myself over time and certainly the input and the level of courage and focus and understanding of the issue that it takes to put together a document that really speaks to people in a way that has them take uh, what's contained within it and, and make it actionable is a neat trick, and I think that you all have really done that uh, work very uh, succinctly, and you should be recognized for it. Uh, there are a couple different uh, pieces in here, certainly the beliefs. I was glad we took the time to go over the belief statements, and I would encourage each person in the room to really believe, read these belief statements, think about what they mean, what they mean to us as a state, what they mean to um, the students that we serve, and work to take those statements to heart. They are um, exactly correct. The OEIB case for equity, uh, tomorrow I have an opportunity to speak to the Oregon Leadership Network, which is a coalition of school districts that are working on equity, and so I hope that I can read the, the statement that's contained within the case for equity to that group because I think it will really speak to the people in the state that are doing this work, which is a very important part of the document, is that it speaks to educators in the state, that it speaks to the Oregon Education Investment Board, and it speaks to the people of Oregon as we work to create a P through 20 education system that is going to work for all students. As we start to put this work together, I think about what we did when um, the OEIB worked to look at the metrics that were selected within the strategic plan. And the Oregon Department of Education worked in putting together the metrics that are within the strategic plan. Both of those really speak to equity in a very specific way. And this um, equity lens matches up those metrics and those efforts in a very nice way. And as we put together this work, and as you all do your work, it provides us with exactly what it, what it is called out, a lens by which we can look at that work and think about the decisions that we make and how that work is put together in a way that will make sure to deliver equity and equitable outcomes for the students in the state of Oregon. So I just think it is a really rich document. Um, and I want to congratulate you all for the work that you did in putting that together. And um, I heartily endorse what's contained here. And most importantly, I think that it really speaks to um, OEIB, Dr. Crew, myself, um, in leading the department about the work that we have to do in this state. And it gives us an opportunity to compare that and match up our work to what's contained within this document so that we get the outcomes that we intend. So I just want to thank you for providing us with the opportunity to have a document that gives us that kind of strength and purpose. Thank you, Rob. Cool. So I'm not going to have a lot of comments. I do just want to share that we have the unique challenge of having many more people who wanted to come and testify than what we were able to allow for today. So I want to thank all of the folks who came out in support and um, all of the individuals who wanted to come and testify, we apologize, we couldn't accommodate every voice. Um, but I think there's great pride that there's such resounding support from um, all communities across the state. We are in a little bit of a time crunch. Um, we need to wrap up this portion by 3 o'clock, and I would like to complete by having a vote in support of this piece. So I would like to put the question out to my peers on the AIB about if there's discussion or comment, but I also want to um, urge us to uh, get to a vote as well. So uh, I would take that as a, as a motion to uh, adopt the, the equity lens. Second. Uh, which has been seconded. Uh, opportunity for discussion. Yes, I have and then uh, uh, Dave. I think there's a lot of great work that's gone into this. Um, and I think it is absolutely what we talked about from the beginning is having this conversation. <coughs> the piece on the bottom of page one, the last sentence, starting at the bottom of page one, and then goes on to page two, about creating um, a set of concrete criteria and policies in order to reverse this trend. That is the work that we need to do, and the devil can be put to make sure we get it right. How do we ensure moving forward that the individuals who testified today, the individuals that have given the input on what it is we need to do that are um, important in this process, how do we ensure that they're truly engaged in creating these policies and programs moving forward? Is there some plan in place or who's going to, who's going to be monitoring that, I guess? 
So I think we, we like many other committees, have really grappled with the role of the OEIB and the fact that we are a policy board. And so our charge is to really create the highest level of policy and to give Rob and Rudy the clearest policy with the clearest intent and belief and value system. And it's our job to hire um, the best person possible to implement and do this work, which I believe we have done with Rudy. But at some point, we are not going to get in and micromanage the, the details of the day to day. And I think that's one balance where um, we have to believe that we will have that level of community engagement. I think that what we've tried to do is demonstrate that in this process. I don't see us backing away from that, but we also have to be clear about our role. We are a policy committee. We are not going to be the day to day um, implementers of this. But that wasn't what I was asking us to do. I'm asking who's going to be in charge of it. Will it be Doris? Will it be Dr. Crew? Who's going to be? It will be Dr. Crew and the uh, and the Rock. Rock. Oh. Thank you. I just like to uh, add a comment to that because um, having been involved in equity work my entire career, uh, I know that it it is always challenging, and oftentimes we look to the very people that the policy and the lens is trying to address to always be the speakers. I feel like that always has to be the participants. I just want to charge all of us as board members to say you gave us some very good, uh, first of all, beliefs to study as Rob suggests. I think we all need to take a, our own look at that and decide to what degree are they our beliefs. And I want to challenge us in, their, in the places where it might challenge our past beliefs and cause us to change our beliefs, because I think that's important for transformational change. Second of all, I think we should use the guiding questions that uh, you offer us in every single thing we do. So even thinking about the first one, you know, so who are the groups we're talking about? To remind ourselves in one another. I don't think the work should always be the advocacy groups or the groups themselves who are being identified, but the responsibility is in every one of us. Because this kind of equity lens, it's about policy, it's about the detailed work, it's about the way we think, it's about the way we ask the questions, and it's about the way we approach our work. And so I just think everyone in this room and everyone in this state needs to own the lens and take that responsibility. I know that's probably more than you were really asking about the detail, but I feel really uh, compelled after all the years in the state, and I'm really excited that this conversation is at this level. I was able to be in a group that was giving feedback and to listen to the feedback, and I too want to say I think the team did an awesome job of really honoring the, the time people spent in giving feedback, and I uh, really appreciate your outreach to how many groups you reached to. Thank you, Dave. No? Yes, Governor. But first of all, thank you for commenting on Mike McLaren. That is quite a, quite a loss to our immediate community here. Thank you for mentioning that. On the equity lens, I think, you know, we're, we're here, we're the choir. We, we buy into this. We buy into this. But I think, I think one thing that need, needs to be really put out there is the economic return on investment and why that is important to all of us. You go through the preambles that's tied to prosperity of Oregon and then the other one, intentional investments. I think uh, I think that's that can be spelled out to why it's important to everyone in the community. Yes, we want the transformation of life. And I see the young gal from from Salem, uh, Venetia, I believe her first name was Vanessa. Vanessa, but Vanessa. Uh, you know, if she was with Oregon Youth Authority and she was under Measure 11, uh, in nine years we would spend seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for her. And so there's a there's a, we can have a win win here. We can have a transformation of life. We can have equality for everyone. I like what you said about immoral and parity. Immoral parity can be the high tide that leads our whole state up economically also and also with individual lives. So I think we can have a, a real win-win here outside of this room who maybe some people will buy into it, but you can sell the point if you want to put it that way, that what's in it for them is for the economic drivers here. And uh, I think it's very important to have that framework and not just the... Uh, as some people might say, the warm, fuzzy stuff here. But I mean, we're talking about lives, of course, but we're also economic drivers. Think of the return on investment on the lower end of the spectrum of Department of Human Services, the Department of Corrections, uh, the, uh, the subsidies we have for benefits for people who are unemployment. I mean, it's, it's, this whole thing can work together on a positive 
for Oregon to make it the best place to live. And by the way, uh, we live here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, let me just say that uh, I know this was written with an eye to our education system, but so I tend to take this to the end and to our agency heads as well, make sure that they're very conversant in this and, and, and use this as a, as a guide for, for their investments and, and their policy uh, that, they, uh, that they develop. Um, any other comment? Yes. Yeah. Um, just to sort of go back to this, you know, I've been talking about so how we make this um, a living, more of a living document. And I think having served on a local school board, a lot of what happens at the state level, policy gets passed, everybody feels good about it, um, but then it doesn't actually translate into sort of on the ground. Um, activity and so you know I think about how this comes alive and I think we really need to probably have a much deeper conversation with um, the school boards association the superintendents because um, they're the ones passing the budgets adopting the policies that are guiding sort of the venture to go down to the, the school level and I think if we, if we don't do that then it will just be something that's a very high level that you know, sets, sets a North Star but um, maybe from the day to day aspect that's doesn't fun. have the impact on students that we want it to have. And then the last thing is just a big shout out to the Rough Riders. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> Julie, that's an excellent suggestion. We'll definitely follow through on that. Uh, would you like to close your motion? Uh, yes. Just receive it. Uh, just object to the one that I have to say. Okay, is there objection to the motion? Very nice so word. Thank you all for coming. I, um, before we get a break here for 15 minutes, I uh, received some very sad news over this morning, and I will share it to you now. I understand it's going to be public, but um, former representative and uh, speaker Lynn Lundquist uh, passed away this morning. Mm -hmm. And um, as many of you know, Lynn was. Um, He was a colleague back in the late uh, 1990s when we actually developed the, uh, the quality education model. He was a real champion for uh, public education in Oregon, and he will definitely be missed. share best practice, learn from one another, maybe do some peer review, identify exemplars, and eventually uh, be able to not only identify and duplicate some exemplar models around services to ELL students, but also to be able to scale up across the entire state. There is a group of us who together did this work. It's a fairly small group. I'd like to just uh, we say the names, David Bautista, myself, Miriam Fox, a consultant from California. Karen Gray was the, is the superintendent of Park Rose. Dr. Sandy Huss uh, from Salem Kaiser. Steve Larson from Hillsboro. Doris McGoon from OEIB. Salon Noor from Salem Kaiser. Chuck Ransom from Woodburn. Bill Rhodes from Westland Wilsonville. Hilda from OEIB and Jada from OEIB. I'd like to say thank you to uh, those folks who spent two days and a lot of time on the internet uh, putting together this plan. And to the, today, Steve Larson and Sandy Huss will be sharing our plan. The Best Practices panel um, is bringing this to you with the recommendation that we, as a board, support this plan and moving it on to ODE so they can begin the work. Thank you, Sandy and Steve. Could I just do a, a point of order? Oh, that's right. Um, this was supposed to be an action item on the board. If you recall, the last time the board met, we did talk about this. And so, in essence, this is a second reading. So our intention today is to try to move this forward um, and take a vote on it. So if you just keep that in mind, and of course, we'll have a, a discussion. Hopefully, we can get there. Thank you. So I'm going to make a few general remarks, and then uh, we're going to briefly talk you through the eight high-level recommendations that we have identified in the strategic plan. I want to start by giving a, a call out and a commendation to Yvonne 
and the work that she did. Uh, Dr. Crew, when she called me and said that you'd asked her to do this, and I said, and you said yes? <laughs> because I was a little worried about the timeline and the workload, and she did a beautiful, beautiful job of including lots of voices and making sure it was a very high quality, so good choice. Um, what we're going to propose that you all uh, hopefully adopt and approve is a strategic plan that aligns with what school districts who are really making a difference with English language learners would be doing within their district. So what we've done is taken the concepts, the values, the mission, the strategies, lifted them out of successful school districts and are applying them across the state. Um, in general, our first recommendation is that we need to really understand who our English language learners are in this state. We need to know what are their strengths, what are their needs, what languages do they speak, what cultural backgrounds, family backgrounds, academic backgrounds, what countries do they come from, where are they populated, so in other words, do we have five students in one area or do we have 500 students in an area, really analyzing the students and their strengths and their needs will allow us then to look at the variety of research, mo research proven models and best practices so that we can make sure that we're doing a good match between students and uh, their backgrounds. Um, and I say that because a lot of the information in this report feels rather complex to me, particularly if you haven't been working in this content area for a long time. Mm -hmm. Some of us have been, some of us have not. But in general, I'm going to kind of summarize by saying there are three different, and, and I know I'm overgeneralizing this, but please allow me to do it. There are three really different big picture models we're talking about. A dual language or an immersion model where you're really hoping that all students will exit fluent in at least two languages. An early exit or a late exit, and we decided to rename it earlier today like a graduation. You're not really exiting, you're graduating. Uh, but an early or a late exit program, which is uh, for the Basically, we support students in their native language for the purpose of being sure that they're making rapid progress academically while we intentionally introduce English from early on to be sure that when they exit, they keep as much native language as possible, but recognizing we won't be able to support them in their native language all the way through the K-12 system. And then finally, what is an ESL model? And that model would be where you have very small numbers of a certain language spoken and you're not able to uh, staff it in either a dual language or an early or a late exit. Okay, So that's kind of in general what we're talking about today. Also what you'll see in our recommendations are three simple concepts. Who is going to teach, what are they going to teach, and how are they going to teach. So you will see recommendations about quality of educator, who is going to provide the instruction. You'll hear from us that we believe all teachers that work in Oregon need to be prepared to work with English language learners. What are they going to teach? You'll hear from us that curriculum and assessments need to align with the models, and they need to be considered first, not as an afterthought after we've designed the rest of the curriculum. And you're going to hear from us talking about instructional practices and how do we build capacity in schools and with teachers and students for the best instructional strategies. Then the last piece that I will use just as an introduction is when we talk about English language learners, and again I'm going to oversimplify it, we usually refer to them in five levels. Level one is a student who doesn't speak any English at all. Level two is a student who's really beginning to be receptive in English, but they don't vocalize a lot yet. Level three is a student who's conversational, and levels four and five are students who are now needing to move into and through academic language. Um, I, I say that because a lot of the practices that we need to intensely focus on will look at all five levels. The good news is a lot of the practices for level four and five students actually benefit lots of students in the school. So when we lift this boat of helping our English language learners, we will actually be providing a lot of support for teachers of all students and everyone will benefit. So that being said, um, I would like to flip straight to this one. Thank you, Steve. Uh, basically, this is an overview of the process that we used, and I think uh, Yvonne described it quite well. 
Um, I would just add that in addition to the design work that we started with the English Language Learners uh, Collaborative, and then it moved into the committee that Rudy commissioned Yvonne to do, we also vetted it. You'll see in the third box down on the right, we had an opportunity to vet that uh, primarily with educators and in a, now bringing it to you. On the vision, we want English learners to achieve their dreams and we want them to stay in Oregon. We want them to feel proud that this is their state, that we care about them, and that they can contribute to a world-class public education system by staying in Oregon, a return on investment, as Dick Withnell said earlier. We also want this particular uh, concept of working with ELL students to be so powerful that the very best educator in the nation are want, going to want to come here, that we will become a pride point. We'd like to also be able to attract businesses who have a focus on multilingual staff and that they would come here again because they see Oregon as having a strength in understanding the need for diversity, bilingual and multilingual. And we also see Oregon being able to contribute to worldwide efforts in terms of improving education. Our mission statement is that ELL students will be ready with language and academic skills to be successful in college in multiple career pathways. And our value statements are really important to us, um, and, and hopefully they will be as important to you. In fact, I'm sure this wasn't coincidental that this was planned today following the equity lens mm -hmm. conversation because it's just a perfect uh, handoff. And thank you, Nicole, for all the work that you did with that. On the value statements, we think it's really important that we demonstrate not only an acceptance, but a strong appreciation for varieties of cultures and languages. We believe that ELL students must, must have access to a rigorous curriculum, and that is sometimes very challenging to do, especially in more isolated parts of the state. We heard that even from some of the Portland kids up here today, and it's critical that they get access to advanced courses and rigorous courses. We believe that um, they need to be graduates who are sought after, that universities will see them, and uh, businesses who hire them will see them as a real strength. We believe in using the research-informed models that we should not use um, public or political opinion as to the kind of models we may need to educate our public and our politicians, but we want to match the students' needs with the research-based models. We also believe that training and professional development is critical. Uh, I look forward to the day when every single student who comes out of a school of education is well trained and prepared to work with English language learners. We're Amen. currently doing a lot of that training uh, in our school system and I know our university partners are wanting to move in that direction. We want to do that with them. Uh, and a lot of them are already there actually. Uh, we also believe that multilingualism will strengthen our education programs and preparing kids for the future. And we strongly believe that parent education and partnerships are a really critical, critical part of education. Steve is going to go through the first five goals, and then I'll wrap it up. And, and as we go through them, if you want to ask questions, that's fine. If you want to wait to the end, that's okay, too. Okay. Dr. Crew, members of the board, uh, thank you for having us again. I really appreciate the opportunity. What you'll see, I'll set up the context for these action steps. In order, um, if you take a look at the, uh, the values that we laid out, what you'll see is over eight goal statements. We've integrated those values into real actionable steps with uh, specific metrics that align well with the uh, ODE general strategic plan. So we've done a lot of work in our strategic planning group to make sure that this really fits and this really stuff that can be done um, over a course of one year and of course five years and on to 2025. So our goals, the eight goals are, are nested in the context of three general ideas. Uh, the first is identifying what um, we want our, uh, our school districts investing in in regards to um, programs for English language learners. The second overall uh, theme is building capacity to do it well, do it with uh, quality and fidelity and consistency over time. And the third is to invest in continuous improvement models so that uh, regardless of where we are in that implementation cycle, we're always looking to evaluate the degree to which we're doing it well and making um, uh, improvement efforts along the way. So the first goal uh, is certainly to ensure that um, all students have access to quality programs um, and uh, as well as give leaders, uh, those who are leading schools, leading districts, the tools they need in order to support the, the implementation. 
And we'll do that through a variety of strategies. In this presentation, we gave you year one of the strategies. Um, in further documents, you'll see that there are years four through, or uh, two through four, which have annual iterations of each one of these goal statements. So I'll just bring out uh, a couple of these along the way. So the first is to identify those research-based uh, and research-informed program models. For example, dual language, uh, early exit, late exit, like Sandy mentioned. Uh, and what are those quality indicators uh, that um, uh, schools can monitor to make sure that they're uh, implementing those programs uh, with fidelity? And then perhaps uh, developing a rubric um, uh, for um, the state, uh, for leaders around the state to use to benchmark progress over time. Uh, and then start to generate a resource uh, repository so that uh, uh, districts throughout our state can start to um, coalesce and find strength in each other's work um, and borrow it. Moving on to goal two, we have uh, capacity building, uh, which is really about uh, communications planning. Uh, we want to make sure that all of our stakeholders continue to be engaged in this work and that they know that um, this work is never... Um, uh, without review. Um, and annually, we want uh, feedback along the way from our partners, our teachers, um, our families, to make sure that we're continuing to invest in effective practices. Uh, in order to do that, um, we're gonna, uh, we would ask that there's a communication strategy uh, for sharing the research-based programs uh, with all stakeholders, uh, that we identify a recommended plan for professional development to be presented over the over three to five years, utilizing research based on information and teacher input, and that would require a, a pretty healthy uh, relationship with higher education. Uh, and then we share the um, ELL uh, strategic plan with stakeholders, um, the various stakeholders throughout our community. Our third goal is, of course, to uh, increase the involvement of our families and communities around this work. Um, with the achievement gap as large as it is, it is in our, our state, uh, the only way that we'll get this uh, work moving forward is with a collective efficacy with all of our stakeholders. And we'll do that through um, strong partnerships with organizations that are already working on behalf of all of our students. So in order to do this, uh, we look at uh, gathering baseline data in all of our districts to determine the degree to which our families are engaged and set bench benchmarking metrics uh, in order to increase that involvement over time. Uh, this needs assessment um, we envision could be uh, implemented at every district uh, and would be a, a context for ongoing conversation across districts about what's working and what's working well. Our third goal is to, uh, or our fourth goal, excuse me, is to really focus on our continuous improvement um, program. Uh, we envision uh, the identification of experts uh, in our state uh, to serve as leaders um, in program implementation, uh, and those experts uh, could support the professional development that we offer either regionally or um, by district or throughout the state. Some of the strategies that we um, have identified as uh, um, that could work to do this is uh, identify a team that's commissioned by ODE and charged with the responsibility to provide uh, sh a stewardship over the metrics in this plan. Um, and this team would work with all of the, the, the necessary partners to ensure that capacity is developed in common areas throughout the state. And then our fifth goal is uh, um, about scaling up um, and doing it uh, well over time. So we want to make sure that all districts have the opportunities to learn about and replicate effective models, that we incentivize um, and create opportunities for districts to become mentors to other districts or schools to become mentors with other districts, much like uh, is intended with our waiver uh, for No Child Left Behind. There's a lot of potential in uh, um, accessing each other, our colleagues throughout the state, and so we'd like to use this model as a way to advance our programs for English language learners. The sixth goal is really about how are we going to measure so that we can monitor and make adjustments along the way. We want the assessment systems that we use in Oregon to align with the model. That means if we're using native language in, uh, instruction and literacy, we need to measure native language literacy acquisition. Uh, if we're doing a deliberate introduction of English in speaking, reading, listening, and writing, then we need to be, have formative assessments that allow us to monitor students' progress in that. Only when we monitor those things will we be able to make enough adjustments 
to see what's actually uh, causing success. The other thing that we have included in this section is that we need to look at the successful English language learner students and why they were successful. Currently, once you're successful after two years, we drop them out of the subgroup. And we miss a real opportunity of analyzing backwards, why did this stay, student stay in the subgroup? Why did this student successfully graduate from the English language learner program? And what can we learn from that so that we can make adjustments so all students are successful? On the seventh goal, we're looking at providing educators with the knowledge and the skills that they need to serve English learners. Um, obviously, in addition to the instructional practices that I referred to earlier, uh, we also need to focus on cultural sensitivity, cultural capacity to work with folks that have different backgrounds. And as we really need to get very serious about how we're going to attract additional minorities, bilingual and multilingual people into this wonderful profession called education. Uh, earlier today in the best practices subgroup, we talked a lot about getting our um, ELL students engaged in three and four year old programs. I would like to suggest that we also need to be actively recruiting our very, very talented high school students of minority and bilingual status and attracting them into education programs. Even if we decided tomorrow that we were able to offer three and four year old ELL programs, preschool programs, we would really be challenged to find qualified teachers to go into those programs. So um, finding ways to attract them out of high school uh, and moving in that direction would be highly recommended. And then the eighth goal, which we know may be a ways off, but we definitely feel very strongly about it, is we believe we should have universal preschool programs with a particular focus on children who have great needs, and we would include in that English language learners. Uh, right now, we have uh, a great desire and a vision to move in this direction in this state. Um, I've been as involved as I could be in the early learning hub here locally, and as I've gone out and started looking at not only the preschools that Salem-Kaiser has, but the other early childhood or preschool offerings here around the Salem-Kaiser School District, I see um, some really strong programs, but when I look at the student population, it does not mirror the K-12 student population. And some of that may be access, some of it may be cultural understanding of families needing just to, to learn what's available, a lot of it, I believe, is because the three and the four-year-old teachers don't speak Spanish. And ELL in our district, 90% of the 10,000 kids who hear a language other than English at night are hearing Spanish. And I think if they saw teachers who spoke the language that their children understand, they'd be much, much more inclined to consider an early childhood experience for them. So those are our eight recommendations, and I have some concluding comments, but I'll pause for a minute and see if you have any questions or dialogue for us. Yeah. I'd just like to raise that uh, for, for dialogue. Uh, several places, I want to compliment you for the work you've done. I want to raise that several places in the document, you mentioned parent groups and you don't mention community groups. And particularly important in terms of dealing with, with ELL. So I, I, I want to I hope we can get to that. Super feedback, thank you. The other one, um, gosh, Sandy, has it been two years already since our No Child Left Behind? Mm -hmm. um, where's the teeth in this? We, we talk nice and we pat each other on the back. Um, I got started in school segregation 40 years ago where districts were under court order and, and other places, and I'm not suggesting that, but there were some teeth there were some attempts to make some uh, something that said you have to get to this point and you have to get to this point in a measured amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I have not seen in the 20 some years I've been in Oregon where we've looked each other in the eye and said, you're failing Latino students, you've been failing Latino students, You've got to do better, or we're going to do something. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for that something at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't mean about hitting people in the head with a stick, but I am really disappointed that we haven't gotten to where we need to get. And I see this as a blueprint for going there, but I don't see us saying, 
there's there are consequences. So uh, let me just first of all thank you for the honest feedback and, and the power of the conviction of your statements. I really appreciate that. Uh, I think that we uh, were commissioned to do something to design how we're going to make everybody move forward. And I think that's what this has. I wouldn't disagree with you about the impatience and needing to have teeth in terms of consequences. I would challenge that we don't have the assessment systems in place right now. They exist. Whether it's going inside a district and looking at their programs or whether it's looking at student data, we've got to get that part designed so we make sure when we use the teeth that we've appropriately identified places that aren't making progress. It's a start. It's a start, yeah. And I'd also say it's, it's, it's the cost of going quickly through a, a large, large document, but we have identified under each of the goals some very specific metrics that we would hold ourselves accountable to as a collective uh, that will help, not to mention the, uh, the role that the Achievement Compact plays um, in closing the achievement gap uh, for districts. I would mention that. Mark. Sandy, throughout the work done, was there much conversation about the weights following these kids? The weighted formula? No. No, we're, we didn't address funding formula. One of the recommendations for review with our, you know, our, our report earlier from our subcommittee was just that, taking a look at the weighted formula. And when you look at the weights for this population and the amount of dollars, uh, I guess that, that was raised as a concern. And when I look at this document, what I see for the first time since I've been in Oregon, maybe to help you out a little bit, is at least an attempt to start consolidating efforts and starting to have a common vision mm -hmm. so that we can really look at that. Yeah. And we haven't even had that to this point. So what I see is a tremendous <coughs> amount of work to pull together best practices from a state view. Mm -hmm. You know, Rudy, you've mentioned several times of looking at several states on the West Coast. Maybe that could be something that could expand upon this world. <laughs> but really good work to start this conversation. Because I hear what you're saying, and to me, as you were saying that, saying, oh, I'm thinking of the weights. And is that following those kids? Well, we're definitely not getting results with those kids. I don't know if it is or not, but what I see is for the first time, at least a consolidated effort of where we're going. Let me, can if I give you an example of, uh, that I think will hook into your comment and the comment previous to that. Currently in Salem-Kaiser, if I want to know how the ELL kids are doing, the fastest thing I can grab is an Oak score. Okay? Almost all of them are taking that test in English. And I'm teaching them in Spanish. Third and fourth grade, eight and nine-year-old kids are being instructed in Spanish while they're learning English to be sure that their literacy is progressing and the test score I'm going to grab is in English. So I have a little bit of access. So I can go to the school and I can say, show me your DRA and EDL, whatever this stands for, you can tell me later. Uh, there are two reading tests. One of them we give in English, one of them we give in Spanish, and the teachers monitor that from kindergarten all the way through the elementary progress. And they can point, most of the time it's on the wall, to any specific student, exactly where they are in reading, exactly where they are in Spanish, and what it is that's keeping them from making progress. They've got formative assessment data that they can grab. Um, and then I have a much better picture of whether or not they're making progress. So if we had that kind of a system in place where we could talk commonly across district lines and and Steve could say, we're getting progress in speaking and listening, and these are the kinds of assessments and strategies that we're using, we would then have a very quick way to separate the field. Right now, what we've got are a bunch of averages in assessments that are all given, almost all, given in English. And it's not, it's not helping us actually get into the diagnosis. So I really do think we have to build the structure for, let me say it this way, we have to believe in the mission and the values and get started on the best practices. If we start working just on structure, which is consequences and money, we're going to miss the opportunity. I really sincerely believe on the momentum. Can I add to that? If we do that too quickly. When we started this conversation as a collaborative a few years ago, really the uh, 
reason we got together is because we all felt we were being hammered with a monitoring process that really wasn't getting at the depth of the kinds of questions and issues we needed to get at. And so a group of superintendents got together and talked about the dilemmas we were having within our districts and knowing that we had some best practice uh, practices and models within our districts, but also some really strong staff members who actually knew what we ought to be doing. And we said, what would happen if we all got together, worked in a collaborative manner, came to consensus, and really stayed focused on best practice. So I just want to say that it was, in, it was intentional that we did not go down the road of what is the hammer here, because that was not really helping us solve problems and get to uh, improved outcomes for students. Additionally, when it comes to the budget, we know budget has to be addressed, but talking about the spending, the, the formula gets us in a very different conversation. Um, it doesn't keep us all together focused on best practice and what we ought to be doing for students. It gets into a whole belief about what, what the formula does and doesn't do. Now that doesn't mean that we don't need to have very targeted dollars both within the state and within the districts to address the issues, but I'm not sure combining that conversation with this conversation is going to allow us to move forward. One is a best practice conversation around instruction and, the, and assessments and how we use all of that to inform um, getting better and better, creating more exemplars and, and duplicating them across the, the, the state. The other one is a political conversation and there's some policy and practice involved there, but I would suggest that we sort of keep those separate while we make uh, progress and figure out what is the right answer. But I don't know that it's right within the same piece of work or in um, really the same group of people who might be looking at best practices. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make one comment and then make sure we hear from other committee members just because we are trying to um, have a vote on this today. What I want to say is it is part of the strategic plan, it is on the scorecard. So we as OEIB members, we are accountable to work with and through Rudy and Rob to make sure this happens. So there's definitely, I think the first time in my history as a educator, educational leader, there's uh, something that we need to point to and this is an investment board and anything on that strategic plan uh, definitely is the things we look at when we say what do we need to invest in to get all our kids to 40, 40, 20. That's the sort of thing. So um, with that, I want to see if there's any more questions. Ben, do you have something? Yeah, if I could, Nancy, thank you. I, I wonder whether there was, um, what sort of attention the, the subcommittee paid to English learners in the post-secondary system. Uh, you know, pr I presume there are both entry barriers for English learners, uh, as well as challenges related to completion that are alluded to at least at, at one point here. And I would also expect there are efforts underway within our public and private universities to address those types of issues. So understanding that defini definitions may become challenging, since we have a very um, singular sort of prescribed definition of what an English language learner is in K-12, but did you get into the post-secondary? No, and we were definitely a K-12 group. Yeah, weren't there P12. yet? P12. We did have the P12. Preschool. Thank you. Yeah. We do have anchored in here in several places the recommendation that the, some of the first steps would be extending the conversation to post secondary. We just didn't have enough time. There are too many moving pieces. But uh, certainly our view would be that this would become a P20 plan. I used to have a button in my office that said World Peace. And my staff would pull it out every now and then to remind me that we didn't have to do it all if we were going to just do this part today. So that's kind of where we were. Questions from that other committee members? Okay, do, do I hear a motion? I move acceptance of the yellow plan as presented. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the plan passes. Nancy, can I make just a couple of... Closing comments. Co closing comments and then see if Steve wants to do that as well. So when we took this to the superintendent's group to vet it, it was the first time in my seven years that we spent an hour talking about the needs of English language learners. And it was absolutely uh, joyful to watch the superintendents get into deep dialogue about what's going on in their community. And part of the joy for me was they were really struggling with issues around race with issues around prejudice, with issues about being misinformed 
about um, citizenship and desire to do well in our community. And I say that because I think that when we move forward with the Lens for Equity and we move forward with this particular strategic plan, it is going to take a lot of bold leadership and a lot of compassion with our community that doesn't understand where we are right now, but not so much compassion that we allow them to stay there. Because in addition to just you know using our energy to make things happen, we've got a lot of folks out in the field who really want to make something happen and still don't have enough information to figure out how to do it. So I'm trying to reinforce what we heard from the equity group earlier and to say that this one carries a lot of those same issues. It's not just instructional practice. It's being able to explain to your community, as Dick said, why this is going to be a great return on investment, and it's the right thing to do for our families and our children. Thank you. I would just like to say, having been a, <clears throat> a, a bilingual practitioner for some time now, I would just like to uh, give a heartfelt thank you uh, to Dr. Carew and to Rob Saxton for leading this work and charging us with the uh, building a plan for the first time ever. Uh, we've got written um, measures of success that we will monitor um, around English language learners and there are droves of bilingual educators who stand ready to support this work uh, at whenever it gets assigned. So. May I have one piece of information, and that is that this is, we showed you the first year strategies, but our team was so excited and so clear about what needs to be done. We actually have each of these strategies um, identified through four years, so we have a bigger document that we will pass on to OEE, but that, that's the energy that has been behind this and will continue to support the plan. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure. I think that equity and partnership has. Um, there, there's not. Does that committee have anything equity and partnership? I didn't think so. We just did best practices, governance, Mary, and policy. Have you met, or is there no report there? So the last thing we have is we do have one public comment, and that is um, Mr. Buell. So if you want to come up, and I know you know. The procedure, which is um, three minutes, and our staff here is our time two minutes. Okay, My name is Steve Buell. I'm speaking for as a founding member of Oregon Save Our Schools. Dr. Crew and the governor came up to Portland in a town hall, and Dr. Crew made the comment that uh, we've gone too far on the testing. It's over the line, and he's right. And one of the, but when we come back, when I come back down here and I look at the strategic plan and I look at the OD, the Oregon Department of Education plan, we're focused still on this generalized testing that is so damaging to our schools. And you saw a really great example today. You looked at the equity, and you now have a, this equity lens to look through. If you look through the testing from an equity lens, you don't want it. It doesn't work well. It messes things up. You then you saw. Also here today, talking about the ELL plan. That, that's a lot of what gets in the way of what we're doing in our schools is we have so much time and energy invested in the testing. This generalized testing that's so damaging in the schools, it's, all, it's invested there. Where, where do you get the time to do the ELL stuff? Where do you get the time in your schools to really sit down and, and work on the equity stuff when, you're, when testing is so pervasive and takes over particularly in the poorer schools in the state of Oregon. And so here's another great reason to, to look and say, N -n -n you're right, Dr. Crew, we've way overdone it. We need to do something about that. We're, you're still not. In fact, you're pushing it. And one of the things I learned in 40 years of teaching school is stuff that comes down from the top, more often than not, gets corrupted out in those schools and you push where the, where you're pushing, the schools put their energy where the push becomes. As long as we're going to continue to push the testing, 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 you're not going to get the ALL stuff done, you're not going to get the equity stuff done because it doesn't work together. So choose. It's up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Any last comments? If not, we are adjourned.